I don't really know how to put it on. Sunday service. We're so happy to see you or see your name on our Zoom. <laughs> We're glad that you could join us. Uh, so I just wanted to open this up in prayer and then uh, I will invite the worship team up <laughs> onto, onto the screen. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to meet today to hear from your word. Uh, you are so worthy of our praise, our worship, our honor. And so um, these, uh, these next um, few hours that we spend with um, our fellow believers, our sisters and brothers in Christ, um, I pray that we would be able to fully focus on you, um, that we would be refreshed by your word, that we would be able to start this upcoming week with you on our minds. Um, thank you for um, all of the hands that went into the service, and we pray that this time would be honoring and glorifying to you. Um, thank you. Praise things in your name. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. As Christians, we're called to be different, holy, and set apart. And what that looks like in practice 
is that through our actions, we display love, peace, joy, kindness in all circumstances and to all people, even our enemies. And in Matthew chapter 7, verse 18 through 20, Jesus says this about believers. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. And so, as we begin our time to worship today, one of the songs we're singing is, They'll know we are Christians by our love. And so may that be our prayer as we begin this time of worship together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that within us you've implanted your Holy Spirit, that through him we might display your fruit, and then we might show love to all the rest of the world, the love that you first showed us. And so we ask that we would be different in our actions, in the way that we live, the things that we say, and the way that we love the rest of the world. And so may that be evident in our lives. Thank you for being the God that first loved us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. If I told you my story If I told you my story, you would hear love. I never gave up. If I told you my story, you would hear love. But it wasn't mine. If I should. Of the grace that is greater than all my sin Of injustice was served And when mercy went Of the kindness of Jesus That draws me in Oh, to tell you my story Is to tell of Him If I told you my story, you would hear victory over the end. If I told you my story, you would hear freedom that was won for me. If I told you my story, you would hear that overcome the grave. If I should speak, then let it be of the grace that is greater than all my sin of injustice was served and when mercy wins of the kindness of Jesus that draws me in oh to tell you my story is to tell of him this is my story this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. For the grace that is greater than all. Of injustice was served And when mercy wins Of the kindness of Jesus That draws me in Oh, to tell you 
my story is to tell of the grace that is greater than all my sin of injustice was served and when mercy went of the kindness of Jesus that draws me in oh to tell of you my story is to tell of him oh to tell of you my story is to tell of him this is our story, this is our song, praising our Savior all the day long. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we'll be our Christians by our love. We will walk with each other, walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we'll be Christians by our FBC. Today we're going to be sharing on uh, the next commandment of the Ten, uh, and it is the concept of guarding marriage with a command that explicitly says, you shall not commit adultery. There was a song sung by Linda Ronstadt uh, several decades ago called Blue Bayou. You know, now I, I'm sure it was a, a song that was used to describe uh, a, a beautiful area in the southeast, you know, lagoons. But, um, or may, maybe Pirates of the Caribbean at uh, Disneyland. But uh, Blue Bayou actually became a theme when I would play sports because I would be horrible at defense and I would try to guard somebody dribbling and trying to shoot a basket and they would just, they run past me and they would, you know, they could just say, I blew by you. Or I was playing football and the receiver that I'm trying to defend, they just run right by me and they could have just saying, I blew by you. And so, uh, it, you know, defense is a very hard thing, but a very important thing to do in sports. Fort Knox is worth defending because that's where a majority of our nation's gold is stored. Our country, as we've been watching uh, the bombings going on in Israel and Palestine, I mean, that it's when we think about protecting our country, how important that is and how grateful I am for our military uh, defending us. Or when we think of all the protection needed to protect our community from COVID, uh, some things are just worth protecting. And it is important to protect what God has instituted. The worship of the one true God was the focus of the first four commandments, that, that uh, idolatry would not interfere with, with the worship of the one true God. And then the, the fifth command is that of honoring uh, one another, because society and uh, is is worth protecting, and then the commandment on uh, the sacredness of human life and the sacredness of family, and today the sacredness of God's institution of marriage is worth defending. You shall not commit adultery, is what he says. 
there was a zombie movie on TV. I, I, I saw a teeny bit of it. I didn't get to watch it. But the premise was that uh, there was some kind of disease that uh, when people bit each other, uh, they would die and turn into zombies. And it affected the whole world. And, uh, and so we have, in a sense, become like moral zombies worldwide. There's a widespread of perversion that has bit us and it has uh, infected us to a point where society no longer blinks an eye at sexual immorality and just accepts it for what it is. But, but this begins the decay of the moral climate of a nation, of a culture, and of a family. And what God instituted morally, what God instituted in his laws and his commands are worth protecting. And the whole reason for this commandment on not committing adultery and all of its tangents is not to portray God as a prude because he created marriage and he created sex, but to guard that which is special that God has made for our benefit, to protect uh, the, the joy and the sacredness and the, uh, the purity of marriage. And so that's why marriage is worth guarding. And we just can't let all the stuff uh, come into our lives and just letting it blow by us or saying, I blew by you. And so let's take a look at why marriage is so wonderful to guard First, it's because it's God's idea. It's God's idea. One of the uh, beauties is, uh, see, we have to think of the first five books of the Bible as, as, uh, as a whole package, right? I mean, for the Jews today, the Torah, which is the first five books, we call it also the Pentateuch uh, because it's the first five books of the Bible. These are the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so we can't separate Exodus from Genesis. And in Genesis, which is the book of beginnings, God, God is using Moses to remind Israel as they're going through the wilderness that the God who created them is the God who's going to deliver them. And when we take a look at the book of Exodus, again, the theme is the God who created them is, is the God who is delivering them. And when we uh, think of uh, honoring a God, we're, we're honoring our creator. When we are thinking of, of, uh, of the, the worship that comes in, we're, we're focused, uh, while we even talked about remembering the Sabbath, the whole point of remembering the Sabbath was to remember our creator who is our, also our redeemer. And so we must connect marriage in Exodus and this commandment of no adultery with the purpose for marriage in Genesis. And we're reminded in Genesis that marriage is about companionship. After God created the universe and he looked around and said, it is not, everything is good for six days of creation. It was good. And, uh, and uh, seven times he said in Genesis 1, he looked at his creation and said it was good, but the very first thing he said was not good was that man would be alone. And so he created a helper. There was a need for companionship. There was a need for cooperation when, when he said, I will make a helper fit for him. And when we think of the term helper, we might think societally that can be degrading just to think of a marriage partner as the help. But this was a term that was used of God, uh, by God of himself. He called himself our helper. He said that over and over in scripture. In fact, Moses named his son Eliezer, El meaning God and Ezer meaning helper, meaning God is my helper. And, and this is the same term that's used for a spouse, because we can't do this alone, the majority of us, right? And we need a spouse to, to, uh, to support us. So marriage is made for companionship, for cooperation with a helper. It's meant to complete us as he created, um, as he created one that was fit for us. 
You know, a, a, a perfect counterpart is the word that's used here to see to describe a helper that is fit for Adam, one that will complete him, one who is his opposite, one that will uh, fill out the whole, fill out the two pieces. Uh, that are, are jagged and separate, but you put it together, it's one cohesive piece like you see in some of the jewelry, right? Where you get kind of a half a heart and a half a heart and then you put it together and what do you got? Bippity boppity boo. Also marriage is about celebration where, where finally uh, there was a helper that was brought to the presence of, of Adam. You know, he didn't just wake up and she was there he woke up and God brought her, brought him his bride. As, as a father walks his daughter down the aisle to present his daughter to the groom, God presented Eve as Adam's gift. And he celebrated uh, uh, saying, whoa, man, because he was just so excited. Now, actually, uh, he used the word for soft, which was a play on the word for hard, uh, and uh, uh, which was used to describe man, Ishan Isha. But this was a celebration because now there was bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh, and they shall become one flesh. Uh, there should be this closeness and this wonderful intimacy. And so this is a beautiful institution that God intended for a husband and a wife to become one flesh for the purpose of companionship, cooperation, completion, celebration, and closeness. And yet, this is marred by adultery. This is marred by a perversion. Uh, and the world doesn't like what we would call biblical marriage, or some might call it traditional marriage because, it, uh, because of biblical traditions. And, uh, and we live in a day that's pushing the edge of uh, or, or just erasing the boundaries of what God intended for our good, because we need it. God also created the purpose. Uh, uh, he also created sex. And we don't want to think of God as a prude who, uh, and that what he created is dirty. Uh, it can be perverted. But when God created it, he created it for marital enjoyment. Proverbs says, let your fountains be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth as a loving deer and a graceful doe and uh, being raptured by her love. And so, uh, so here we see that uh, he wants sex to be enjoyable in the context of marriage. And if you read the Song of Solomon, you will see these, these descriptions of, of the enjoyment of what God created. It's also meant to be for meaningful intimacy. You know, Song of Solomon just uh, talked about uh, describing the joy of God's gift of sex. And, uh, and then um, the, the Shulamite bride recounts, his mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. And this is my friend. And so this is something where it's it's not casual. It's not a hookup. It is a friendship. It is a, a, an emotionally connected, meaningful relationship that is enjoying the physical expression of what God has created. It is also about mutual love. This is a nice romantic verse, uh, Genesis 26, 8. And it came to pass uh, when he had been uh, there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through the window and he saw that there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. All right. So, I mean, this is, you know, I mean, he looked down and he sees Isaac and Rebekah necking. You know, I mean, just kind of, uh, you know, to, to just kind of put it in uh, low terms, right? But, but it was he was he was seeing the PDA, the public display of affection there, and it's uh, God created uh, sex for uh, several of these re reasons, and I mean, not to mention the the purpose of procreation and and children. I don't know how I forgot that point, but I mean, that's that's it didn't start with an M. All right, third. Uh, so so God created. The, the beautiful gifts of marriage and sex. That's why he wants to protect it. 
He wants to pro prohibit the desecration of God's institution of marriage. And he does so with this command that is so repeated in the scripture from Leviticus, uh, where you shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife to defile yourself with her. Uh, Deuteronomy, Matthew, uh, a couple of times, the uh, Gospel of Luke, Romans, and James, all restate this important commandment. Uh, it is to set a guard against what God has created, beautiful, special, sacred, holy. And so there is great prohibition. In fact, the punishment of adultery in the Old Testament for the nation of Israel during the time of Moses, all right, not for today, but, but at that time was so severe, it was capital punishment of a man commits adultery with the wife of a neighbor, both the adulterer and adulteress shall surely be put to death. We see it's often in the New Testament where we do see marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. All right, so it doesn't talk about an immediate death sentence as, as Leviticus did, but there is judgment for adultery, even in the New Testament. In fact, it's not just the act of adultery. It's even the mental uh, uh, thought of lust that is egregious before God. Jesus even said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So this problem of lust is like adultery. So Jesus uses these things to these religious leaders to say, all right, you've never killed a man, but you've hated all right, you've uh, you you've never broken an oath, but you've lied. You've never may have commit uh, the physical act of adultery, but you have mentally, and so this is egregious before God. Now there are some who might think, and I I love how Alistair Begg addressed this in his book Pathway to Freedom. There are some who falsely reason, you know, well, since I've already committed adultery in my heart. I might as well go ahead and follow through with the action. Either way, I'm guilty. Now, without lessening the impact of Jesus' teaching, he says, we recognize substantial differences. Adultery breaks the marriage covenant. Adulterous thoughts do not. Adultery provides grounds for divorce. Mental adultery does not. Adultery violates and defiles each other's bodies. Its mental counterpart does not. Adultery is the vehicle for sexually transmitted diseases, whereas the mind is not. So again, we're not trying to justify um, uh, one is better than the other. They're all evil before God. But the physical act of adultery does carry different and, and uh, other penalties. But the, the sin of lust is still wrong, as, as, as hate won't carry the same penalties as murder. All right. Uh, but yet hate is still an egregious sin before God that must be dealt with. So not just protecting from the physical act, but also the mental act and the emotional crossing of over into sin, we must guard. And so I'm just going to share for someone comment. There's, there's a whole lot more we can cover, but, um, but, but when we think of adultery, this is uh, uh, sex with another partner other than your spouse. So it would be a marriage-less partner, one, one who is not your married spouse. Uh, prevalent today is premarital sex, where, where uh, younger people will have sex before marriage, or, or, which is still outside of marriage. We have pornography, which is malicious pictures, and homosexuality, misused passions. And so so, uh, so I'm just going to touch just a little bit on, uh, on some of these uh, topics because these are ways that we don't adulterate marriage. And if you're single, you're protecting your future marriage. If you're married, you're protecting your current marriage. Uh, and if you're widowed or not married anymore, you're setting an example for the next generation. And that's why this is important 
for all of us. Let's talk about adultery. And we can take a look at the, uh, uh, we can take a look at David not going to war when it, he sent everybody else off to war. And so he's just kind of hanging around on his highly elevated palace, looking down at a bathing woman. And, uh, and when he should have been out there with his armor on, he's lying around and he was a vulnerable uh, it was in the springtime when kings normally go out to battle. David sent Joab uh, and all of Israel to destroy the people of Ammon. Uh, but David remained at Jerusalem. So everybody else was fighting and he wasn't. And we need to be careful with our leisure time when, when we are not busy or intense. And it's those, those times that we can be very vulnerable. Then he got into the problem of eyeing, where it happened one evening, David arose from his bed, walked onto his roof, and he spotted a woman bathing who was beautiful to behold. And, and so his, his, uh, his eye caught something. Now, to this point, he has not sinned. Temptation is not a sin. As Erwin Lutzer wrote, temptation is not a sin. It is a call to battle. John Truton Collins said, we are no more responsible for the evil thoughts that pass through our minds than a scarecrow for the birds which fly over the seed plot he has to guard. The sole responsibility in each case is to prevent them from settling. And so if this was it and David stopped at this point, he would not have sinned. But then he made the decision to defy and he turned from righteousness David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? I mean, Uriah is your, uh, he's one of your fighting soldiers. That's his wife, you know, and then uh, she's also the daughter of Eliam, one of your advisors, and this granddaughter of Ahithophel, you know, one of well, you know, people who you know, but yet he, he, he personally made a choice to step over the boundary that God had said of do not commit adultery, right? He made a choice. If he stopped at step two, he would have been all right. But he went for step three and he defied. And then he tried. He took part in the sin. And then the, you know, and then you can read about the whole tarnish of the sin afterwards, but lying, eyeing, defying, trying, and sighing, you know, if, if you stop at step two and, uh, you know, but, but even then you, you, you prevent step one, right? It's, uh, uh, we'll, we, we will be okay if we prevent these steps, but, but each step is a choice, right? We're presented choices. And when we choose to Across God's boundary, we are we're, we're we're making a choice to defy what God has laid out for us in His law. So, so so it should be way out, not way to out. <laughs> I must have just had my uh, my filling waffle when I, I typed that. But uh, but way out, and then watch out, watch out. For my husband is not home, he has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him, and he will come home on an appointed day. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately, he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till an arrow struck his liver as a bird hastens to the snare. He did not know it would cost his life. You know, I mean, Proverbs is very blunt, about what happens when we are seduced into adultery and we are like an ox to the slaughter, a fool to the stocks, a bird to the snare, it will cost our life if we don't watch out. So, so that's why Proverbs is guarding us. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple, they just pass and they're punished. Philip Riken wrote in his book, Written in Stone, he says, sex is like superglue. Squeezing it out at the wrong time or in the wrong way always creates an awful mess. 
the wrong thing gets joined together and getting them unstuck again tears at the soul. This is why adultery is forbidden. It is because sex is a great force for good, but only when it is used to join one man and one woman for life. I thought that was a pretty good illustration from Philip Riken. So, you know, David waited out, but he made the wrong choices. Proverbs is telling us to watch out, to weigh out, watch out, and then get out. We get a positive example from Joseph when, when uh, the, the captain, Potiphar, his wife tried to seduce him. She caught him by the garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside. He fled as Paul tells Timothy to flee youthful lusts. There are temptations we are told in scriptures to fight. But when it comes to the area of lust, we're told to run. We're told to flee. We're told to get out. Charles Spurgeon said, learn, oh, learn to say no. It will be of more use to you than to be able to read Latin. You know, there's some of us who think, you know, the more scholarly we are, the more pious we are. No, we just need to learn how to say no. And, uh, and, and that will keep us out of trouble. Get out. So, uh, so this is the issue of adultery. Another form of adultery, because these are all forms of adultery that are, are uh, prevalent today, is the area of premarital sex. Uh, and God has a purpose for sex, but to do it outside of his purpose for marriage is misguided. It's outside of his will. First Thessalonians, Paul writes, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Possess your own vessel, your body, in sanctification and honor, not like the Gentiles who do the, who are activated by the passion of lust. We should not take advantage. We should not defraud. Defraud is the concept of going beyond, right? And so, uh, uh, so you know, I know a lot of times there are couples who will, uh, who are dating, you will ask, well, how far can we go? Well, when we arouse a desire that cannot be righteously fulfilled, that's when it's too far, right? And people go, oh, you know, is it hugging? Is it kissing? Is it holding hands? When you arouse a sexual desire that cannot be righteously fulfilled, that's too far. That's defrauding. That is mentioned here in verse six. And notice, I mean, you want to talk about the Avengers, all right, the Lord is the avenger of all such. All right, he he wants to protect morality. He wants to protect sexuality. He wants to protect marriage, and he will be an avenger. He says, "You're forewar forewarned." God didn't call us uncleanness, but the holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us His Holy Spirit. All right, violating this commandment isn't just about what we have done to people; it's what we've done to God, because. We are saying, you know, what you made, it stinks. You know, I'm going to do it my way because I think it's better. And that's what premarital sex tells God. A, a third way that people battle this today is pornography, malicious pictures. Uh, there are all kinds of statistics, and every year we, we can look at the statistics, they're always changing. It, it, it is, I mean, I got a bunch of statistics if you want to look at the notes, uh, and it's, it's, it's disturbing. It is not only a problem for males, it is also a problem for females. Uh, and uh, um, and so, so, so this is an everybody problem. And technology has made it so pervasive. We have to be all the more on guard. We have to be like what Job mentioned. I have made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl. And then ladies flip that around or, you know, or in the day of same sex attraction, maybe not. But I mean, th this is the point that we don't look lustfully at somebody and, uh, and, and so we have to make this covenant with our eyes to be careful little eyes what you see because it is addictive. Proverbs says, hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. You know, and so just like Hamilton, we're, we're never satisfied. And, and uh, you know, and that was a, a theme, not only for Hamilton, but for us. 
and uh, and so so the eyes of man are never satisfied and so uh so if we can encourage men and women and no longer is it just men or just young men it's young men older men young women young, older women that uh, that 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 this is something we all need to guard against get accountability you're not alone you're not the only one but we're also not designed to do this alone for us to uh, the, the, the scriptures are full of one another's because we need to admonish one another comfort one another encourage one another exhort one another to righteousness pray for one another uh, and it's important to get good accountability it's also important to avoid triggers um covenant eyes which is a program that uh that I use for my uh, computer and phone. And these are uh, things that uh, uh, cut off accessibilities, you know, but, uh, uh, but they have a website. If you go to covenantize.com and, uh, and they suggest some triggers that people can uh, uh, turn off, such as keeping their phone or computer in their bedroom at night, boredom, you know, people are bored, so they start surfing. And if you're surfing without having a clear destination to go, you can get in all kinds of trouble. All right. I mean, oh, okay, I'm bored. Let's watch TikTok. And, uh, you know, or, uh, or you know, let somebody, you know, do you just go search around, you get in all kinds of trouble. Or, or uh, other triggers, rejection, loneliness, being bullied, uh, and uh, stressful situations. Those, those are some... Uh, triggers that can spur one towards the area of uh, pornography. And so get accountability, uh, identify and avoid triggers, and then cut off accessibilities. And so, uh, so make sure that there's no access to these things as we make that covenant with our eyes, as Job did in Job 31. One last topic is the idea of homosexuality, which is misused passion. And I know there's a lot of thought today, you know, well, who are we to judge? Just let people love the way they want to love. Well, where does it, where does it end once we go beyond what God has prescribed as his purpose? You know, I mean, uh, do we draw the line at homosexuality, bigamy, polygamy? You know, at what age do you draw the line at, you know, where do you draw the lines, right? And so he has lines and uh, uh, for the area of morality, because it goes back to rightful desires that he has placed in us. But when we allow our passions to, to go in a different direction or at a different intensity that he uh, has uh, planned, then, then we get into the area of lust. The, the word lust in the New Testament uh, is built off the word for desire. There's a normal desire, thumia, but then there's an over-desire, epithumia, which is lust. And so that's why it's not just in a different direction, but it's at a different intensity than God has desired. And so so for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use of what is against nature, all right? How do we know? Nature, all right? And procreation, that's, that, that was God's design. But likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the women burned in their lust for one another, men uh, with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And so those who say, oh, well, you know, homosexuality is never condemned in the Bible. It is. It, it is in the Old Testament. It's very clear in the book of Romans. First Corinthians tells us that, you know, homosexuality is not necessarily worse than other sexual sins. But fornication, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, they are. And their unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those are sins for which people are condemned for. But it's it's sinful because of misused passion outside of what God has designed. And so as we are thinking of these categories that, uh, uh, that can cause us to commit adultery, we need to respond with an escape plan, always, uh, always being ready uh, to run. Um, 
in our uh, this police academy that I've been taking, we, we've been put in these scenarios, you, you know, when we're confronted with uh, people who might harass us or, or become violent towards us. And, uh, and one of the rules is, you know, make sure you keep a distance, keep a distance from those who you're trying to deal with, because that's your safety. And, uh, you know, that's, that, that's a really good rule, even when it comes to the uh, issues of, uh, of sex and immorality. Keep a good, healthy distance. You know, there were some situations where I should have stayed behind the police door, you know, because that was, uh, you know, that would protect, you know, the, 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 the simulation bullets from, from being shot if I stayed behind the police door or if I, if I had just kept a distance, you know, from those that we're trying to deal with. And so in the same way, uh, we need to be ready to run. We need to be ready to flee from youthful lust or run like Joseph, a prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, as Proverbs says. Kevin Lehman shares this uh, illustration of, uh, and I've shared this before, but, uh, but it's one of my favorite illustrations of Steve Kerr, the Warriors coach. When he was uh, playing for the University of Arizona, he had one of the best three-point shots. And so Lehman recounts in his book, Keeping Your Family Together, how could someone who isn't all that tall and not gifted with natural speed be so effective in the toughest competition on earth? And his college coach, Lou Olson, summed it up. The key to using Steve Kerr is to keep him out of situations where he is overmatched. If you want to affair proof your marriage, stay out of situations where you are overmatched. All right. And so we need to stay out of being overmatched and flee. Second, guard your marriage. And if you're single, um, you got, you're guarding your future marriage now. And if you're married, you're guarding your present marriage. Guard your marriage. And then inoculate your kids. It's not too late. Uh, uh, and there's appropriate times to talk to your kids. You know, just, just some thoughts here. You know, because parents will say, well, when do we start teaching? You know, before their peers teach them the wrong things. You know, prior to and concurrently with their school's sex ed program, you know, unless you're a homeschooler, then you can develop your own curriculum or whatever. But if, if they're in a school that's going to have these uh, programs, you know, we, we want to prepare them for what God says versus what the world says. Or when they start asking about it and you make age appropriate uh, the discussion, depending on their maturity. What do you say? Well, don't be embarrassed to say that God created sex. Be correct in anatomical terms. Three issues to address, depending on their age, is the biology, God's design, and abstinence. And there is many. There are many passages that you can use. Uh, uh, you know, but you know, first saying, "Hey, God has a purpose for marriage. God has a purpose for sex, and they're good." And to start it, start it off that way, and model uh, a healthy communication and affection purity when it comes to what comes into the house and be normal and natural about your discussions about sexual matters not saying ew why are you talking about that you know and you know the, the don't don't give don't pass on that ew that's sick factor but saying well you know let's talk about that there's god's way and then there's the messed up way you know and uh and, and so find opportunities to talk to your kids about that and so uh so again Marriage is something created wonderfully by God, and it is worth protecting. And that begins with our mind. It begins with the decisions we make. It begins by choices, knowing that, uh, you know, you just don't fall into sin. We choose to sin. And we have to take responsibility for our, our choices, but it is something worth guarding. Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you for the beautiful gift of marriage and sex, that you have created for us to enjoy with our spouse. And, uh, and Father, thank you that you want to protect this, that you, like the country wants to protect Fort Knox and people from COVID and attacks from other countries. Father, you want to protect marriage. And this commandment is so significant, all the more today than it has ever been. Oh, Father, keep us holy before you, that we might be a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ, because it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Steve.
um, such an important message to discuss um, and to uh, support biblical marriage. It's uh, been under attack and, you know, we, the church needs to know what the word of God teaches about that and, and we need to protect it. Um, let me call your attention to a few announcements. Um, our church family share time today, you can type in your prayer requests in your in the chat box now. At the end of um, service, um, Kiana, our Zoom tech, is going to be opening up um, uh, breakout rooms. And you have a choice. You get to pick your own breakout room. Uh, our junior high breakout room is still going to be set up. And so if you're uh, in junior high, middle school, you can put that in your name and then um, um, Kiana will put you in that proper breakout room, but everyone else gets to choose. Uh, our ministry summit is in two weeks, Saturday, May 29th, 930 to 11. We had our first one yesterday. We had a great time just catching up and talking and preparing ourselves for the uh, preparing ourselves to meet together once again pretty soon. If you've seen some of the pictures that Pastor Steve had posted of our church building, it's shaping it's, it's, it's shaping up and coming to form. Uh, it, it's pretty exciting. Uh, Assisted Care uh, is presenting some special Zoom workshop uh, um, from some of the ladies. Um, too bad it's for ladies only, but there's calligraphy on uh, Saturday, May 22nd, uh, July uh, Kathleen's going to teach you about Excel and Google Sheets. Uh, Carol's going to talk about healthy eating in September. And Margaret's going to talk about holiday baking. Great workshop ideas. And so come join our ladies there. Step-by-step uh, -step meets today at 1230, as well as our children's ministry at 1230 on Zoom 2. Young at Heart meets on Monday, uh, tomorrow, May 18th at 10. Zoom one. Pastor Steve's class on uh, theology is continues on Tuesday, um, seven thirty, and the resurrections is the topic this week. Uh, our deadline for signing up for our virtual day camp, uh, the Sweet Love of God, is our theme, is going to be May thirty first. Um, if people want to sign up after, you can contact us, but we're, it would really help us in our preparation. Uh, to just have uh, uh, an idea of everyone who's coming so we can prepare and do our mailing and just get ready for both sessions of our day camp. Registrations online, you can uh, take a picture here for the registration. You can go on our website. There's a direct link there under events and um, uh, uh, events. Um, and so join us for one or two sessions. Our training continues. Uh, next week, we start our day camp training during Sunday school time. Our high school sen Sunday school is ending its series. Uh, and so we have our day camp training on Zoom too. Our next staff meeting is May 30th. Um, CBM camp is planning uh, and um, two sessions. One is a virtual session, July 19 to 24 for middle school and for high school. And, and registration will be up very soon. And there is a live CBM camp. And so if you want to join CBM camp in your middle school, high school, it's one week, July 26 to 31st at the Mount Hope Conference Grounds. We are uh, looking for some help. Uh, we are, uh, this year is a special year. Mount Hope is trying to get back on its feet after not being uh, in, in action. They're struggling with some finances and stuff, and it would really help them out this year if we can provide a kitchen staff. And so uh, we're looking for a volunteer kitchen staff to come up for a week to serve in the kitchen at Mount Hope. And so if you would like to cook, um, and prepare 14 meals for our campers and our staff. We would really appreciate that. You can contact me, just let me know. Uh, we have some volunteers already, but we're looking for about seven to eight people. And this is for uh, July 25th through the 31st at Mount Hope itself. So we're ex excited about that. And we're praying that the Lord will raise up uh, a staff to help in this, in this uh, area. Online giving is still uh, possible, or you can uh, mail it to our physical address on 2710 Ralston Avenue in Belmont. And our missionary of the week are our teachers in Asia. 
And we just connected with some of our teachers recently, but we want to pray for safety and for health and, and them going back to live instruction out there in Asia. We can't disclose their names, um, but um, we want to pray uh, for them. And so uh, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the ministries here at our church. And uh, Lord, we're excited about uh, the ministries online and, and Lord, prepping for uh, live ministries once again pretty soon. Thank you for the work that's being done on our building. But we know, Lord, the church is more than the building. It's, it's the people. And so we thank you for our church family. Continue to uh, use us to be your beacons of light. Help us to proclaim Christ. Uh, to share the gospel message and share the truth of the word of God with others out there. Give us the boldness to do so. And Lord, we thank you for our missionaries, uh, especially those today uh, that we're recognizing, those who are serving in Asia, helping to teach other teachers, helping them to know the word of God and to accurately divide the word of God to, to others out there. And Lord, we know it's a difficult place uh, where we can't even disclose names because of persecution and uh, and uh, people monitoring and all these uh, things that are going on uh, to believers. And so we pray for your uh, church to continue to grow, for the gospel message to continue to be out there, and you continue to use our missionaries in this uh, missions endeavor to uh, bring the gospel to the whole world, Lord. So we thank you and we praise you for them and uh, keep protecting them, Lord, even in the midst of this uh, um, time of COVID. And so uh, we pray for this in Christ's name. Amen.